there for as long as we can. But I guess it's this evening, so good evening. And we have an important topic for our little symposium. The second day of Museum Performance Man. These three ephemeral aspects are brought together by a more clear phenomenon, the city. So which are the bridges? Yesterday we talked about museums, so today we're going to talk about performance. Performance is a term for all those that deal with performance, or they reject it. We have Tina Segal as a producer, Louis Roger, and he prohibits performances as a term it talks about situations. Um, at the beginning of the Tokyo Tina Segal project in Moscow, he mentioned this and talked about this in detail. Um, Osmolovsky, Segal, uh, Lisa Marazova, who's going to join us shortly. Lisa, please take your place on the couch. How all these um, people practice performance within the urban space. Uh, the city sometimes rejects or doesn't know about performances. And that performance has questions or it claims territorial as well to the city. Today, we're going to talk about three important topics. One of them is called performance as a part of cartography, how the city landscapes the city, how it's mapped um, out by performance, how it's altered, how we start to look at it differently, having discovered that there has been a live art project that took place in the urban space. Uh, performance as a mirror, which is another aspect we're going to cover, how it reflects the city, what happens to the city after the performance, what happened before, and how it changed, how it was transformed. And the third topic is performance as a monument. Uh, we have lots of people here who can talk about it at length. Uh, they can all cover all topics, uh, but um, we have 12, 15 minutes for each of the topics, and we can ask questions to uh, all of our speakers. Unfortunately, uh, Victor Mizian is probably not going to make it, but we have seven amazing other participants that are going to talk to you now. I'm going to present everybody left to right. Uh, Sasha Obuchova, head of the Garage Museum Archive, curator of the only large exhibition um, dedicated to Russian performance that was held two years ago at the Garage Museum um, at its um, summer branch, I think, uh, the, 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 park, the Gorky Park. Uh, Sasha, I'll have a round of applause, please. I've worked for many years as a microphone holder, and now I, I feel like misplaced. I feel like it's a TV presenter. But I have to talk about my work. Performance is my work. Everything is going to work out. Don't worry. Peter Verzilov, I guess I don't need to present him at length. Uh, he's um, always there with everything that happens with uh, the group of War and Pussy Riot. Uh, he's an activist. Uh, his project is Media Zone. He's somebody who's a bridge between Russian and international activists, uh, Petr Vrzilov. It was incredibly important for me to uh, invite Anatoly uh, to participate. He has uh, um, questions to everything I want to say and what others are going to say, but that's why this discussion might turn out to be really amazing. We have an artist and art uh, historian and theoretic um, researcher, Anatoly Smolovsky. A lot of you have probably been to the Tretikov Gallery or the Architecture Museum or the Sri Lanka workshops. Today and for the next few days, uh, Tina Sigal is present, and today with his and, and with his invisible ephemeral art, and we have a person present here who uh, produced uh, Tina Sigal's project in Moscow. The current uh, producer, Louis Roger, please a round of applause for him. My great friend. Uh, a very important uh, activist, uh, artist, somebody who thinks about performance and conceptualizes performance, a therapist and the head of a b b performance school, uh, our school that deals with performance, Lisa Morozova. A young art historian, a curator, currently working at the Jewish Museum, uh, making a very interesting exhibition, and uh, my long-term friend, Katya Krilova. 
and finally the most interesting fresh arrival when we have somebody new um, entering the territory and changing the rules you all have probably heard about what has been happening during the summer uh, in Moscow uh, when uh, somebody was walking around the town um, Katrina Nenasheva a performer an artist an activist she's with us tonight as well the first topic performance as a part of the urban mapping. Uh, Kati Krilova is uh, going to talk a little bit about what preceded um, what went on um, recently in Russia. Um, uh, activism, street activism. Uh, Katya is a historian, an art historian, somebody who knows about this in detail. Uh, good evening, everyone. First and foremost, um, talking about performance as an element of urban cartography, I have to tell you that it's a rather ephemeral cartography because performance is non-material and temporary and it leaves a very intangible trace um, on the map of the city, like um, this prints in the atmosphere, uh, in the perception of uh, the urban dwellers. When we talk about performance changing uh, the city, we talk about changing the perception of the city. Uh, as I go through my talk, it would be important for me to make you trace changing the perception of the city as an artist. Previously, it was perceived not as a museum, as a gallery, something that's a structured environment. And the artist didn't really care which streets or squares uh, he would be interacting with and now there's been a shift towards a city as an individual. The city is now perceived as a subject of the historical process, as a platform that has the ability to impact in very many aspects on the audience and the artist himself as a platform that opens up a whole variety of opportunities and pers perspectives. The development of urban performance has to be linked uh, with the uh, golden age of performance in the 60s and the 70s when artists started to want to talk about important issues with an audience that was not a traditional museum goer. Here's a list of the issues, censorship, AIDS, ecology, feminism, homosexuality, and violence towards children. They wanted to clash people with the things they often didn't want to see, wanted to ignore, and never wanted to acknowledge. This is an image uh, on her turn performance. So she documented her walk, an hour long walk, uh, towards the opening of her gallery called Roadworks. And Mona tied the shoes that are traditionally worn by policemen to her feet. One, uh, by skinheads and barefoot, she walked towards uh, the gallery. Uh, all of these um, characteristics, provocative, interactive, interdisciplinary, temporary, non material, made performance incredibly popular in the 60s and the 70s. It was the most independent, the most dynamic, the most reactive format of talking with an audience on topics that the artist really wanted to tackle. Uh, nobody tried to live on performances, on the money they could make off the performances. It was important to research the issue and to research it through direct interaction with the audience and this uh, experimental character, nature of performance determined its popularity. A common place for all of those was demonstrating suffering and this is a performance from 1974, uh, Chris Burden, who's crucified uh, on top of a car for two minutes with the engine running, he was uh, showing to the public his, the, the, the suffering of Chris Burden. He's really hot. First and foremost, a performance was not a gallery. It was trying to come out of the museum space. And this had to do with another ideological aspect. At that point, uh, the council of many museums included heads of corporations that supported the war in Vietnam and the arms race. and trying to distance oneself, uh, break off from these institutions, uh, also 
was done through performance. Uh, here is a Vito Acconci um, cult performance uh, from uh, 1969, I guess the most well-known street performance in history of over three weeks in October in the street of New York. Vito Acconci would choose a random pass it by and follow them at a small distance until they entered some space. He waited for a while uh, and if the subject wouldn't come out so straight away he would follow somebody else and this went on um, all day long and would repeat the next day. What did artists get by interacting with the urban space except being in close proximity with the object of their research, the city dwellers, in their direct everyday experience? The only performance in my presentation that's not a street performance, although it could have been, it best illustrates the level of proximity that the artists were looking for in those days. This is um, Laurel Arlan, a French um, artist who was selling her kisses in the streets of Paris for five francs. The city was also attractive to artists because of its unpredictable reactions response to the artist's actions because a city is not a constant permanent environment. It's an uncontrollable, unmanageable environment and it's really hard to estimate reactions to performances. So this possibility of losing control is much higher. Here you can see uh, Valley Exports um, the theatre of touch performance. It's a serial performance. He repeated it and rolled it out to more than eight cities with reactions differing every time. Sometimes it was accepted uh, very well. It has to do with Valley Export's classical theme of um, pornography and the viewer is this um, a disbeliever who looks in a box and sees uh, the artist's naked breasts in more conservative cities, uh, people were rejecting the performance and some journalists uh, really criticized uh, Valley Export's um, actions, calling her a witch. For a long time she was named the witch, which actually helped her to become even more popular. Moving towards a more conscious perception of the city, the city is seen as an obstacle range, a maze that's very typical for a lot of uh, um, uh, Rassis Lux uh, performances uh, when you have lengthy wandering around the city and as a result you uh, come to a series of encounters. Deoshinichie is the first artist we need to mention in this respect. He came to America in 1974 um, in a ship, an illegal immigrant, and for 14 years he was an illegal immigrant. He lived in New York. And this is his uh, street performance that lasted for an entire year. And uh, he was trying to draw attention to the problem that uh, we are. Uh, all deal with the huge inflow of illegal immigrants that are found all over America and still are. She had decided to go through the entire range of uh, emotions and obstacles um, that an illegal immigrant grows through. Uh, he committed to not walking inside a building, not getting inside a car, uh, and not being under a roof um, for an entire year. He was constantly in open air. He would uh, sleep on cardboard boxes, uh, um, having lunch. You can see this on the internet where the homeless people would meet the journalists outside. The only way to meet him was to meet him um, at random in the street. Uh, during his performance, uh, 365 days, he would fill in this map in red. He would mark the route uh, that he covered uh, around Manhattan and the various occurrences and encounters that happened. At the end of the performance, there was a whole pile of maps uh, and uh, they lead us to a very important conclusion. Um, recognizing the city as a maze or an obstacle course, he would be chaotic. At one point he wanted to turn left, next day he wanted to walk right. 
And it is this itinerary that was not linked to the goals uh, of his performance at all. He was just wandering around with no purpose. Interacting with the city, moving around the city, uh, gave the artist the opportunity to show that the issues that they tried to talk about um, are of a national scale. This is a very, um, Francis Alusa, a very famous uh, Belgian artist. Most of his life he spent in Belgium, then he immigrated to Mexico. Mexico City uh, was something that struck him as uh, brutal, uh, and he still lives there and works there. This is a performance from 1997. It's called uh, Paradox of Praxis. And it demonstrates how, on a daily basis, the efforts of millions of inhabitants of Mexico lead to no results in this corrupted country. Huge, huge money uh, is being spent on uh, moving a uh, piece of ice around uh, the streets of Mexico City, and it just melts away with no result. Another example of gender relations performance uh, by uh, Peter Weil and uh, Valley Export. Uh, she was walking him uh, on a leash around the streets of Vienna. This is a performance from 2011 with the super nice end team. Again, uh, a, a modern contemporary Vienna-based uh, group, they repeated this uh, uh, performance with an inversion. They demonstrated that the inequality of genders is still there 50 years on. This is the only performance in my presentation that has material um, traces in the space of the Josef Beuys, uh, um, 7,000 Oaks, trying to talk about uh, accessibility of creative education, which is a burning issue for any country of the world. Beuys claimed that access to artistic education should be there for every single person. If institutions are not willing to accept everyone, then his goal is to ensure that everybody who wants to get access will provide them an alternative network of universities. This basalt and an oak tree is a potential meeting place uh, for the disciple and the teachers where they can interact as equals and learn from each other. He understood this as Greek therapy when the disciple and the mentor, they meet and they work together on their code of behavior. Together, they practice their civil rebellion. Most of these oaks uh, were planted uh, during uh, Boyce's lifetime and uh, the work goes on and uh, we're really hoping that as a result of these discussions, these monuments that we're going to talk about later in the third part of the discussion are actually going to start being perceived as something that's crucially important. Although there are dozens of my colleagues uh, attending these, I've never seen a, a, a photograph of actually an exchange of knowledge occurring next to these monuments. And the last part of my presentation uh, has to do with an approach to the city as an individual entity coming to modern day. What's the difference? What's characteristic of this period when the city is being perceived as a platform that has its own special features? So the artist isn't just blindly led to some location. Previously, what was important is uh, a traffic of throughput of flow. Now they're interested in specific facilities and destinations of Valley Export body configurations. She was looking for brutal, oppressive, patriarch formats in the Vienna, Vienna of the time, demonstrating how masculine sculpture incorporates and imposes certain lines of behavior. Francis Luce, a performance that transformed the fact of MoMA exhibits being moved from 52nd Street to Queens and uh, you can see in the sketch how he decided to uh, formalize this. It's like a funeral march. At the beginning, you see uh, 
a horse or without a rider, a historical symbol of uh, a funeral procession. Uh, and this incorporates and conceptualizes the interaction between the center and the periphery. Even in a tolerant city like New York in 2002, we see that this aspect is still relevant. And uh, exhibits being moved from um, the center to Queens as their death, they've been moved out of the center. You can see his uh, preparation for the performance and uh, his uh, building an itinerary, he's getting ready, he's planning, he's looking at the map of the city, looking at the routes, uh, and the urban space becomes first and foremost in his performance. Uh, turning to the city as a collective memory, artists try to trigger collective memory. Uh, another example of Luce's performance, uh, he's turning to 1968. Comparing the military that supported the government uh, with the sheep, if you watch the video, you know that the sheep uh, gradually uh, form a procession. They walk around. And at some point, you think it's um, not sheep following a loose, but a loose is following sheep. Uh, Paul Nazareth is another important artist in this discussion. He talks about uh, the relevance of racial hatred in Brazil. Uh, slavery in Brazil was uh, abolished 60 years after serfdom, and there's still traces and echoes of the problem heard in a rather painful way. This performance is called Hair. It's a 12-hour trip. Uh, by Paolo Nazareth to Porto Alegre. He had hair in his mouth, ridding himself of the opportunity to talk and drink, and this is what slaves had to go through. And this was a way to mark an entire long territory uh, as a territory of low tolerance, appealing to collective shame. Another performance by Paolo Nazareth, uh, The Headless Man, illustrates how through his body he marks very different landscapes as a territory with a background of um, mass uh, massacres of slaves. The collective desire for transformation, the slavery is still there. It changes the shape is existing, but immigrants are still there. They're still cleaning our streets and baths. But because today we treat a city as an object with historical memory and legacy, artists, even within the city, are starting to act in accordance with what Julie Didier said. As scientists, as agents of special order, that as garbage collectors that are putting together pieces of reality that are trying to extract extraordinary knowledge and trying to approach our reality at a different angle, provoking subconscious visions. In conclusion, one of my favorite performances by Alos when an artist managed to find a very telling metaphor within the urban space to explain, in this case, an interesting law in Mexico. This is the uh, square of the Constitution, and you see how people use it. They only use the shadow um, of the flag stand to hide from the sun. Thank you. Thank you, Katia. I guess this is a very explicit, very clear um, vision, uh, look into the background. Uh, Katy didn't talk about Russian cartography. Uh, the Russian situation will be treated by Sasha Obukhova. And now, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, we don't have much time, but we do have some time for questions and answers. Go ahead. We need to move on. If you want, Katy will be there to answer your questions. If nobody has any questions, go on. Then we're going to let Katya go. She is in a bit of a hurry. Thank you so much, Katya.
And now we can all make a wish. We have another cat here. And she's not going to talk about history or the international Western experience. She's going to talk about Russia. And uh, she had a way to delineate it herself. Uh, she moved performance into a format that has to exist in Russia. The social, not political, but still very relevant weak spot something that's really a center of public attention. Katina Nashova for 23 days, some of this year, just recently, she was walking around the streets of Moscow. She's going to talk about her experience. She's got um, in VR glasses. Um, Katrina Nashova's uh, exhibition is now in the Solanka Gallery. It's been prolonged, I think, till the end of September, so you're welcome to come. Uh, Katia is there quite often. She is there to share her experiences. This is the first time when an artist with their first uh, work just a month ago is already exhibited in the museum, and we're incredibly proud and we're huge fans of Katia's work. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is my third work, and my uh, artistic approach is based on performative everyday experiences. Previously, I had a month long, 23 day long um, performance. I'm always researching corporality and communication in the city, I would like to, to share certain experiences that I went through as part of my last performance. It was called Between There um, and Here. I was walking around the city wearing VR glasses with a panoramic 360 views uh, from a Moscow um, lunatic asylums, these isolated places for people with mental disabilities that are still existing based on documents from 1978. And the key specifics there is that people locked up there are never allowed to walk out. They can never do it alone. And as part of my performance, I was trying to look into um, borderline existences uh, of artists and those uh, Moscovites, uh, Russians, um, and reality. Uh, this. Uh, uh, the, the routes that uh, I picked uh, uh, for the performance, they were conceptualized uh, together with uh, uh, asylum dwellers, and they sent me somewhere where they can't go themselves, where they would like to have access to, but they can't. So as part of this performance, uh, I was always uh, documenting everything. Text is always a big part of my work. I compiled uh, uh, the small map uh, uh, of uh, my movements uh, as a performance of a poem, um, and I would like to read it out loud to you. Uh, and here on the screen, what you're going to see is the video of my movement um, filmed by GoPro. These are very different locations, markets, uh, shops, uh, metro stations. Nobody can predict where I was going to. The artery starts uh, from the shoulder, from the artery. It's a nameless city that just emerged from the ruins of my body, uh, a stone city that just killed its inhabitants, a flower city with poisonous petals. The day of Bogdan Khmelnytsky lost pillars, lost foundations. We're looking into another panoramic view of the asylum. I was moving forward looking for something to grasp to. I tried to breathe in the air. Yeah, it seemed that somebody else has touched my hand and we started moving in circles. We made a circular movement together. Was it really happening? I was thinking about it all night and then I burst down crying because I couldn't verify whether it really happened or not. Not a single foundation, nothing to grab onto. A person is me. I am the obstacle. I am the body, complete emptiness, vacuum the void among hundreds of voids. Day number four, the Moscow Central Ring Center of Helplessness. I wanted to fall. I wanted to ask for help, but I couldn't. I wanted to sit down, but I couldn't know. I don't know how I wanted to talk, but this loud silence, I started to cry, hoping to strike up a dialogue. You can't see the tears behind the glasses. They're flowing in back into my eyes. I 
run out of the Botanic Metro Station and I was leaning against the window. I tried to walk with the VR glasses around the entire ring, but I couldn't make manage even a hub. I'm, I'm crying my tears and I can see the people entering the subway. I just ran away from them. I'm looking for my reflection in the glass, trying to identify where I am. Day six, uh, the garden ring, my pain is alleviated. I was moving around the garden ring yesterday. At some point, I found myself in absolute vacuum. I was trying to grab onto the air. I was trying to find something to hang on to, something tangible, something real, but there was nothing. And then I crashed into a wall. I closed my eyes tight, and I felt pain from the glasses. The wall saved me. I'm here. I was here. My body was here. It scratched after the bang. It was there in the garden ring. The new harbor, day seven, zero point. Stand with the magnets, Moscow, the domes. I'm looking around you. It's never going to end until I take off the helmet. Somebody talk to me, please. A woman, a singer, singing Leningrad, that stupid song. If you shut up, I'm going to lose myself, the direction again. I will never come out of the streets. What is our bad? What is the corridor in my glasses? The same picture over and over. Please sing when you start sinking quieter, I start moving backwards, I start turning, I start reaching out to the left, to the right. If you shut up, I'll fall through the soft asphalt. I'm almost finding myself. I can move on. I have to go on. I have to go left. I can make wide steps. I need to go over the steps. I have to move on. I have to move forward. It can't be. I'm moving into the various directions. I'm moving forward. The people are somewhere close to me. There's no way out. A crowd. I feel the crowd around me. Maybe I'm part of the crowd. It's as if they're crashing me. There's people in the queues queuing for something in the little shop. I can hear voices, hundreds of thousands of voices. I raise my hands, the tips of my fingers seem to be dissolving in air. I can't feel myself. I can't heal myself here. They tend the Moscow Metro point of relationships between people grabbing me by my feet, by my hand, trying to check how I will react. Ten people grab me, people trying to control my movements that are advising me to walk towards rails, people, six people, people that look into the VR glasses, they think that they are somewhere in a borderline state. Three people, people that offered help, four people, people that said that being in VR in a public space is banned. Two people, people that were walking around in circles, hitting me with a bang. One person, person showing me fuck to check if I can see him or not. One person, people that were trying to trip me, three people. Day 14, the cursed train station going around in circles, dialogue with a 35-year-old man going north in the fifth car. A lot of people capable that cannot handle. Do you know what I mean? Maybe these people should be isolated. Maybe that's the way to go. They can see, they know what's going on behind the fence. Probably not, because it's limited. For the same year, they see the same picture that we can see in these glasses. But we live here in the same way, the office, the metro, electrica, year and year, the same spots that we see, that we hate. Everything is the same for you. Yes, work electric train, back and forth, back and forth, going in circles. Everybody lives like that. Why do you think this happens? How do we impact this? What has to happen from the external world? Can you imagine somebody who for 50 years has been sitting in an office cubicle? I can. I have every opportunity to be one of them. But you can try to come out of this vicious circle. It's impossible. It's not easy. You can. You need to adapt. And you, but it's possible, maybe. But it's very scary. We were going to Belasha High, I think, day 16, Lubyanka, the cult of good dialogue. So many trees. Can you see the trees? They look in the VR. They look in the fence of one of the asylums. The fence is an aquarium drawing of trees. They continue with the real trees behind the fence. I thought these were real trees. I told her about my performance. I told her about the asylums. I have good memories. I was in a hospital with a, a post-nasal depression. They gave me pills. It made me feel better. Everybody would scare me. It's an asylum. Everybody was worried for me. The order of the day. Good people. They just saved me. I remember that. 
that's my experience. I remember we were taken for a walk and we were walking around in circles and they would give us these coats. And I thought back about Van Gogh uh, and his uh, prisoners and we were going in circles. And I was thinking, it's good, it's good. I was spreading my arms out. Day 18, the sterile sub institute, your actions are unclear. It's unclear what you're doing. I'm walking around in a VR glasses. Why are you doing it? Hold on to the fence. Don't touch the walls. I need to be oriented in space. Walk forward. Don't touch the fence. Your actions here can be interpreted differently. I'm going to skip some of it because I'm running out of time. Day 22, the garden ring, the point of no return. I'm lost. I'm confused. I'm being sunk into dust, into sand. Circle one, circle two, the construction sites and the garden ring. I'm walking around. It's. I don't have space for my body anymore in this kingdom. It's eternal. It's endless. I can hear a voice. It's somebody else's voice. There's nothing to hold on to. I have to walk around any way, any direction. You're not lonely. You're not isolated. You're not helpless. Who are you? I can see. I can't see your face. Your your actions are strange. Which one of the realities is yours? Is it the one that belongs to you? What would the movement in this point be? Is unpredictable. We start with a nameless name that began on the ruins of my body, of the stones that killed its inhabitants. It's a flower city with poisonous petals. Thank you. It would be difficult for um, uh, Kate to understand what this was. Uh, who didn't understand what we were talking about at all? I guess the one thing that I would want to add, something that seems important to me, when an artist comes to Red Square, and this happens to a lot of artists in the history of performance in Russia, as we know, as a rule, uh, there's the same outcome. They're locked up, taken to uh, the police station. But unlike uh, Pavlensky, uh, that was let go, uh, Kate was sent to a psychiatric asylum. She was somebody who could get arrested. Uh, she was somebody as, as she was acting like somebody who could be sent uh, to a lunatic asylum. Uh, Cassie, is that okay that I'm telling the story for you? I think it's incredibly important, and that's why she met a psychiatrist first. She was sort of changed into pajamas, and then she was washed in a bath. Uh, then she was changed into this white robe, as they do with the newcomers at psychiatric institutions. And then she had this conversation with a psychiatrist. And she got lucky, because the psychiatrist that was seeing her was one of the 300, I guess one out of the 300 that was practicing. And uh, it was an art therapist. And he questioned Katya, and he let her go. I respect your art, he said. I'm somebody who deals with art therapy. I read the thread in uh, Katya's uh, Facebook. Everybody who deals with psychiatry said that he was. it was impossible. It was one out of 300 chance that this was happening. She got really lucky. They didn't start injecting her. She, she didn't turn into a vegetable and didn't come out two months later and completely lost. Uh, it was some kind of incredible luck that happens, I guess, uh, when there is this godly protection for an artist that saves the artist from things that can happen, uh, protecting them from the unwanted experiences. Um, uh, we'll open up to questions now. We have a couple of uh, minutes if you've got questions to Katya. It's an incredibly important uh, social experience, not just artistic. And just wait a second for the microphone. Why did you attach the camera not to your head, but to your hand? And why were you constantly moving it? What were you trying to do? I didn't have any money for a, a head camera, like the, the headset, the grip. It's not conceptualized. What, what if you had the grip? There's no conceptual backing for the video. So if you had the grip for the camera, where, if you had the grip for the camera, where would you attach it? Would you attach it to your head? Probably, maybe. Then I would have had to wear. I already had a helmet. It wouldn't have been very comfortable, I guess. 
Are there any further questions? Go ahead. Catherine, do you know that when you go to Red Square, you, you knew something would happen, you still went there. The question is why? And would you do it again? This act, every location of the city had certain semantics that was important to me because together with people from the asylum we picked the various locations that they wanted to go to but couldn't or that they've never been to or will never go to and the red square was for me as an artist became a new symbol that was filled with new meaning because for a lot of people from the asylum this space was symbolic from the point of view of just be having the opportunity to be there. Every time you go to places like this, I was ready sort of for it, but the Red Square and this act sort of was interpreted differently. I was just an object. And the second question, would I do it again? Would you go to Red Square again? Another performance in Red Square? No, the same one. Would you do it again? No. I don't do anything again. I don't repeat my performances and that was a complicated process for me. Going back to reality, being in this in between limbo space now, so I wouldn't do it again. And the last important note, uh, maybe you don't know, 150,000 um, people in Russia are kept behind bars and uh, lunatic asylums. The passports of people are kept in a safe. Uh, the director, they, they, they get their IDs taken away from them. And one of the elements of Katya's um, uh, performance was she burned her own ID, her passport. Um, so it was almost, uh, by the way, by the uh, lunatic asylum. It wasn't lunatic asylum. Well, almost a lunatic asylum. It was the White House. As a popular artist, there has to be lots of legends and apocryphs around you, around your name. So uh, in Moscow, there are five charities uh, uh, for uh, trying to protect uh, these uh, prisoners of lunatic asylums. After, if you want, come up to me and I'll tell you how you can help them. Katia is also the one to go to. Why didn't you call who? Our talk is about the city and the performance, not about how to resolve the, uh, the problem of uh, psychiatric asylums. It's a great question. Thank you very much, uh, Svetlana. I guess it would be interesting uh, to listen to people who sort of manage to get out uh, of the lunatic asylum, that get out into the urban space. Maybe if we had more time. I guess it just didn't occur to me. It's a difficult thing to do. We could have. Thank you for the idea, for thing, for the thought. It's an incredibly important topic, but we're going to talk about something slightly different. We'll come back to performances by Katrina Nashua. And I would like to change the topic. Uh, the next is performance as a mirror. What does it reflect in the city? And the first person who's going to talk about it is going to be an art historical and the curator of the Garage Museum Archive, Sasha Obuchova. Let's welcome her. Many of you have seen the exhibition dedicated to the history of the Russian performance at the Garage Museum. And Sasha, I guess, is the only uh, historic and curator who is uh, an in-depth researcher of this topic and who knows every single element. Uh, the history of uh, the background of performance is very subjective. A lot of you might have seen uh, Rosa Goldberg's exhibition um, uh, in the Jewish Museum, uh, the 100th anniversary of performance. I think it was so subjective, and I have um, uh, lots of comments about it. Sasha is going to tell us about uh, Russian performance and its history and background. Good evening. I'm also largely uh, subjective like Rosalind Goldberg, but uh, I do try to keep to certain historical facts and highlights. What I will be able to show as part of this brief presentation has to do with 
the various uh, locations uh, around Moscow, uh, destinations. And the, the, the only thing this uh, overview is uh, lacking is the last uh, five years, perhaps, they have been included because um, I still need time to analyze um, them. As you know, the history of art and performance and situations and actions, I'm a bit wary about using the concept performance. The term is uh, something that I reject, among others. Many people don't know what this means, particularly if we talk to Western colleagues. The history that includes the urban space and the situations within the urban space begins when the Moscow conceptualism school is uh, emerges and one of the first acts is the act of uh, Comrade and Milimids and their disciples and friends that came out into the Red Square to mark the fact that that very day this social art manifesto was signed. They came out into the city, the central part, so that nobody realizes that it's an act. So it's sort of uh, integrated into the everyday flow, and this is a principle that the first uh, activists in the 70s abided by, unlike those that had the most loud uh, urban acts that uh, didn't want to show. I'm talking about the famous bulldozer exhibition. They wanted to draw attention of the international community that's within the land of the Soviets. A lot of people are creating and making art, um, although they are being heavily censored and suppressed. So the performance, as we call it today, of the bulldozer exhibition did live up to its social mission and the underground artists were granted lots of opportunities. So and a lot of the people who were in the underground up till then started to be exhibited in large exhibition spaces. Others preferred to remain in the shadow, disguising their artistic acts as, um, as I said, something that's mundane and a normal flow of reality. And among those people, we had artists uh, from um, the Collective Actions Group. There is a stereotype about Monastirsky and his friends that they had their acts mostly outside of the city. That's not true. Forty percent of what they did happened in Moscow, not always in the outskirts in remote parks of Ismailovo or Sokoyliki. Sometimes uh, they had happenings in central streets uh, in the Vadenha, which is the people's exhibition. And, uh, the way they organized these happenings would to exclude any hint of theatrality and they would uh, try to mimicry reality and the most mundane variation of reality. The nest group artists uh, uh, building on their uh, mentors they used the famous within the small circle finding of Comrade and Melamed with uh, a white sign on uh, the red background is recognized as a social community as an ideological sign approved by the authorities. Uh, so they walked through in the light of day with uh, a white abstract drawing uh, against the red background. Uh, uh, at the crossing of Vilva and Dulyanova, it led to no administrative consequences. The subway plays a huge role in the history of uh, Russian happenings. And it's not by chance, it's one of the biggest concentration of social material where on the one hand you can dissolve, you can get lost, and on the other, you can create situations that would make the viewer turn around or 
pop out of this uh, bleak reality. The um, Toadstool group uh, were hiding their intentions of riding around the metro for 20 plus hours. They completed their mission. They were a few times detained by the police, but finally released with a clean consciousness. During the Soviet times, naturally coming out into the streets of the city was dangerous because artists were existing in a rather hostile environment. Even today, we understand that uh, not every passerby is going to be understanding and non aggressive um, uh, towards artists. What Catherine was just talking about says that something unusual in the public open space um, when you're not protected by the walls of a gallery or museum is a huge risk, particularly in the 70s and the 80s when artists that were doing strange things were perceived as the enemy of the people. So anonymously we had the um, SZ group and they would mark pillars and lampposts uh, and pavements and embankments with their strange encryptions. So it is had why I was always personally drawn to Soviet and post-Soviet performance is that it never intended to deliver any message. It never intended to serve as a tool for social transformation or the political reform making and the society. It was just absurdist. Absurd gestures that would uh, try to bring to the fore reactions uh, from random passers-by. Just like in the 70s and the beginning of the 80s, the end of the 80s was marked by similar spontaneous unnoticeable intrusions into the everyday life. The champions of the world group acted in a similar way in the urban space. They would walk the central embankments and streets and squares. They would meet their friends and they would record the notes of their interaction um, by making photographs. A different attitude emerges with artists that start to work at the end of the 90s and the beginning at uh, the, the end of the 80s beginning of the 90s expropriation of the art territory movement uh, they started to declaratively collide with the society juxtaposing their gesture to the human mass including the political mass at the same time using it as a platform for making non-film movies the 2020 price, we live well during the president, is a happening that happened in the Red Square. Another one called the exclamation mark from 1991. Maybe Anatoly can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the way I remember it. What actually happened, uh, the pretext for the happening was the uh, moral values law. It's a list of laws that imposed a certain uh, ways of uh, behavior onto the city dwellers. And a lot of people were sick of the prospect, uh, although now we're actually living through all of these being implemented and put into life and imposed on us. And um, we, we're surviving, aren't we? This happening in the Red Square had an important mission to select a central spot uh, in the city to desacralize it uh, by decorating a sacral territory with the lowest possible uh, of linguistic elements. We're not talking about corporal. And just like with many others, uh, this uh, happening for a lot of the participants uh, uh, ended with the police station uh, at the Red Square. The Red Square, the Mayakovska Square, they had to be occupied and marked, delineated and this artistic performance is a very ephemeral 
phenomenon uh, form out of artistic expression, but in our country, where the culture is largely based on um, narratives, uh, it's very literature-focused, uh, apocryphs, uh, historical stories are much more significant than uh, physical monuments um, wherever they are erected that you can basically write in a rather literal form of the word and Anatoly Ospolovsky did this uh, who live in the land of Botting Breaks and uh, this uh, performance was held as part of the first formal international um, sacralized street uh, performance festival organized by Russian uh, art historians together with um, a curator group from the Netherlands. This performance by Osmolovsky was blessed by the Moscow authorities, which was rather unexpected. It was a very welcome surprise. Moscow as the background, uh, as a platform, served the artists of the 90s uh, in its most uh, troublesome turmoil and times, like in this photograph uh, um, uh, on the cover of the Radic magazine, uh, the, the shame of the 4th of October. The radical performances of the 90s uh, uh, from the AT group, uh, Anatoly Asmolovsky, Brana Kulik, very often would occur around the streets of Moscow. Brenner and Kulik are now out in a small street located close by where the Gelman Gallery was located um, and they disrupted not just the artistic atmosphere but the traffic situation as well. That was rather intensive. You can run around in the streets dressed up as a dog. You can make love with your wife. You can ask the president, um, contest him and call him to a boxing match. And you can see the background for these uh, artistic happenings. These are all central locations around Moscow. In the 70s and the 80s, uh, predominantly artists used quiet streets, uh, alleys and remote locations and parks. In the 90s, they used the big city full of people, the crowds, they were willing to initiate a dialogue or a fight, the willingness to live up to your act's incredible openness that would collide against this absolute indifference from the city dwellers and the police. And these two young men were trying to strangle each other with black plastic bags for a long time and none of the passers-by, none of the cars that moved past pay any attention to it whatsoever. I guess I will sum up real quick what I was trying to deliver uh, through the sequence of uh, images. It's curious that when we look at the chronicles of um, uh, the historical events, the highlights uh, of the history of performance, so we very often see uh, the Red Square as a platform for such happenings. Uh, we see the manifest formats, protests, trying to imitate uh, political activism. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about uh, spontaneous and controlled commissions uh, uh, against everyone or it could be just theatrical performances, but you can see sailors carrying red dresses. It doesn't change the essence. It's still uh, a protest, uh, a manifesto. Artists continue to come into conflict with the authorities when they select streets. I like colleagues' performance. Uh, you can see now it was held in the outskirts of the city. 
But in New York and in London, he was arrested for continuing with these uh, artistic happenings in an urban setting. Sometimes artistic happenings inspire a larger political community. Alexei Kalima, um, in his uh, performance, he's uh, chalking um, a border, a perimeter, um, with um, a chalk to fight with roaches, uh, he's making a white line around uh, uh, the Kremlin. Uh, Bombilla Group are making one around the Garden Ring uh, um, in uh, 2012. Lots of uh, um, Moscowites were standing holding a white ribbon, trying to uh, delineate the center of the city where they thought was um, the concentration of the evil of the world. Again, the subway, again, the Red Square. But what I think matters here is that these formats largely alter the location, the pathos, and in order to appeal to the larger world with a certain message that would, in a way, transform the current order of things, artists no longer need to come out into uh, the Red Square. All they need is to place their text in the spaces where they can be read, just like in the 70s, in the 80s, and initiate a dialogue, not in the streets, but in the virtual space and social media. I guess uh, this is where I'm going to end my um, talk. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, so many eras, so many layers, very ambitious uh, uh, survey. Thank you so much. Contextually, we won't be able to have a dialogue without this overview. If you have questions, please go ahead. Don't be shy. Or we can move on, and then you can ask your questions later. I guess uh, you have lots of ideas. Thank you so much for showing an image that is younger than five years old. I guess uh, we can't overlook him. It's um, an unforgettable moment. If you have questions, please raise your hands. If not, let's go on. Uh, and um, Lisa Morozova, if she can take the microphone. Lisa, as another representative of the Moscow performance and happenings. So she's also very delicate with terminology and she's going to talk a little bit uh, about her not very numerous urban happenings. You have a question to Sasha? Okay, we'll give you the microphone. Uh, good evening. I have three small questions with uh, small answers, if you may. Can performance be without a purpose? Is performance an art? And the third question, why, what's the meaning of life? Can art have purpose? Are these questions to me? The utilitarian function of any artistic creation is not a mandatory element. A work of art can be a part of politics or a social activism, but it doesn't have to. Performance is an independent form of art. It has been for quite a while, and um, it's a great pleasure for me to keep proving this over and over. For the first time, I did it in 1992 when I was defending my thesis, my diploma uh, in the Moscow State University Department of Art. Nothing's changed since then. Fewer people are continuing to question whether the, like the Black Square by Malevich is a work of art, and that's something that gives me great joy. And the third question you asked, so the 
about uh, the functional uh, importance of works of art. Like I said, not just creative happenings, uh, other forms of arts can be politically engaged, they can serve as a tools for social therapy, and it's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just part of the um, the style characteristics of um, uh, creative works and uh, over the last decade there's this whole movement uh, called media activism when uh, the artistic tools that have been developed over the decades uh, are applied to uh, political battles so it's a very sort of intermediary state, like a lot of things that have to do with art performances, something between art and life. Thank you. Lisa Morozova. Uh, good evening. I'm off program. I just thought I was very removed from the topic of the city, but we talked about it uh, and I've got something to share. I have less time, so I'll be really quick. I feel like we're missing uh, a, a, a great researcher. Um, we're very empirical, but I can't change this. And, uh, I'm also missing Maxim Luchin uh, because my urban experience, my experience in the streets has to do with working within the letter group at the beginning of the 2000s that existed. I wasn't the most active participant. It was a very interesting group. Uh, Although uh, in the garage and the exhibition it has a tiny uh, spot, but it did do some very impressive stuff. And I also uh, participated. Um, it's different from what I usually do. It's opened up new opportunities for me. I would talk about the letter group a little bit. Uh, this is not the best of my works, uh, but nothing else was recorded, and so this one was. Uh, this group, uh, uh, these are graduates of the first two courses of a school called Ipsy. It wasn't called that. It was like the, the stars, the celebrities uh, sort of came together in uh, the letter group, those people that were interested in performances uh, from 2000 till 2014. Uh, in the summer, during the five days, we used uh, some key destinations around the city, and everybody who wanted artists, non-artists, Masha Kraftova participated, who is a well-known critic. She was a performance artist. Uh, not just her, everybody came together and did a the work at the same time, it has to do with the destination. It, the condition was that it shouldn't impede with anything around the city. It was a very peaceful time. We even made our performance in the Red Square and nothing happened with no consequences in 2000. Uh, first and 11th of September, sometimes it was the beginning of autumn. So these were spontaneous political performances. It always happened differently. But because you asked about me, here's my performance. That uh, we, we chose a spot, uh, a big shopping mall in New Arbat. So the topic of consumption was the, uh, the most relevant topic. Uh, Maxim Luchin, uh, activist of the letter group, I wasn't the most active, like I said. He was uh, walking around the city all day, and then at the time of reunion, he came uh, with huge bags uh, handcuffed uh, with groceries. He bought some groceries in the morning. He was carrying out two huge plastic bags uh, handcuffed to his hands. Uh, I had a similar topic. It wasn't as uh, clear. I also was tackling the consumption topic. Let's watch the video. I went to the shop and I bought loads of long pieces of food and I tied them all together uh, into this huge eternal sausage, a train if you will, and it was an image of uh, a consumer to me and I was going to walk around through New Arbat buying more groceries and tying them all together until this endless 
image of consumption uh, doesn't break off at its own weight, um, so taking consumption to the extreme. So it was a mixed image, like a different theme. I was always interested in fashion, radical fashion, that it sometimes resembles homeless people. My mom always looks like I'm wearing a robe, although it's really um, designer, very expensive clothes that I wear. Uh, the slogan that I had, uh, I'll, I will buy groceries, uh, uh, people who uh, uh, buy medals in the subway, that's what they write. That doesn't matter. What matters is that that's what I did. I walked through Arbat. Nobody sold me anything. It broke off uh, rather quickly. And there were these gypsy kids that uh, grabbed this food and went to eat it. So it turned out to be into a charity mission, although that's not what I initially planned. This is just to illustrate. There were many other interesting uh, performances by the Leto group. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed what we did when we chose the Pushkin Museum. Uh, we had uh, Anton Litvin who participated. He um, closed the doors of the Pushkin Museum with two wooden beams, uh, nailed it shut. Um, I brought flowers to the Pushkin Museum, treating it as a, uh, the graveyard of art. Uh, what else? Let me think. Uh, so that that's where we criticized uh, conventional art. Maxime Lohin dressed up as a, a g g guerrilla worker. He was sort of painted his face uh, um, green, uh, camouflaged, and uh, was uh, committing this illegal penetration. He broke into the Pushkin Museum. He was sort of crawling in the grass, confusing the guards. They just started chasing him, although uh, he had no evil intentions whatsoever. So these are the various images. So maybe this gives you some idea of what we were doing. I'm a very serious person and uh, I use Marina Abramovich as my mentor uh, and uh, that's not the way I was taught to do performance but these are when we allowed ourselves to relax and do something ironic and have fun and light and it was great, it was uh, fun. Uh, we were in a dialogue with the city recently, Katy Krilova who made a presentation today, she, last autumn she was going to be a curator for a festival um, in the metro and my old performance with the Leto, a group, we were going to reenact it uh, in the Moscow subway, but unfortunately it was cancelled. People got scared just by the word of performance. It had to include my performance that I did back in 2001 in the Moscow subway. For instance, I transferred the experience that happens in planes uh, and trains uh, uh, when the steward meets everybody, smiles at them, says hi, welcome, goodbye, have a safe trip. I did that in the subway. People would come out. I would look everybody in the eye. I would wave and smile. And a lot of people were supposed to be doing the same, like dressed up as so it was supposed to be a great performance, but it never took place. The last thing I wanted to mention, can you show uh, our political uh, performance, uh, another type of um, act, this political act that we did together with my colleague uh, from the escape group that no longer exists, Anton uh, Litvin, uh, three years ago before he was forced to immigrate to Prague where he headed the opposition movement, political opposition. He's left art uh, now um, and now he's organizing festivals. He was forced to leave and his artistic performances uh, we, we had police uh, arrived, a very humble uh, sort of act that was happening in the streets. Uh, the last thing we managed to do with him um, three years ago, this was a peacemaking performance uh, uh, just when the war with the Ukraine erupted. Uh, uh, this is the uh, Prospect Mira, Prospect of Peace. It wasn't chosen at random. There were people, 
not just me and Anton, our friends, our colleagues uh, from the world of arts, uh, various uh, civil activists, and uh, the previous photographs together with this uh, big uh, uh, balls of thread of wool. Uh, Ukrainian flag and uh, Russian flag colors, so we had six colors in total, and on the one hand, people from various uh, six balls would make one, and then out of one entangled ball, they would make six uh, different ones, as far as I remember. And that was very powerful at that time, incredibly interesting because we had people spontaneously join in. Sometimes it's our friends, we didn't know they were going to come from the center of contemporary art, so my students, very different people. Um, and we would pass on the baton, uh, this ball of wool that would uh, grow in size right before our eyes and to me that was a uh, an important breaking point so I turned in, into political performances Anton had to immigrate something happened to us then thank you although these are very small contextual gestures these are not masterpieces these are just uh, everyday statements so I almost never talk about it I'm almost done we were called uh, escape we were called escape because we wanted to distance ourselves from the uh, nascent um, glossy world of consumerism. Now we're called Don't Escape, a completely different focus. Uh, uh, we invited everybody not to be indifferent and to join in uh, our uh, civil activism. That's how over the decade we changed everything, including our name. You said very important things because this is a decade when uh, things were radically transformed. When we talk about performance, uh, digesting these transformations, managing these transformations, if anybody has any questions to Lisa, please go ahead and ask them. Again, you can ask your questions after the other speakers. Uh, don't be shy. If you have ideas, please go ahead and raise your hands. Uh, now it's time to talk about international experience uh, uh, because uh, uh, for three days, Tino Segal's exhibition has been happening at the Architecture Museum in the Trechical Gallery and in the workshops in the Selanka Gallery. I would like Louisa Odger to talk a little bit about how Tino Segal's, the situations by Tino Segal feel within an urban environment and how the community reacts to these uh, situations and how uh, he reacts to the community. Uh, if you don't speak English uh, or you're not sure that you will understand, uh, go ahead and pick the headsets up uh, for the interpretation. Hi. Um, uh, thank you. I'm very honored to be here as am I the only non-Russian uh, representative. And also I'm grateful that Lisa went before me because I also feel that we don't, uh, me and Tino, that is, um, specifically interact with the urban environment. So I'm a little bit contrary in many ways here today, but I do think that uh, we are in your city, <laughs> and I think that our work is relevant, and I think that it is hopefully uh, affecting at the very least some sort of uh, discussions and conversations. So uh, to that end, I agree with Fyodor that it's somewhat relevant for me to be here. Um, and also, I have no imagery to show you because maybe you know already, but uh, Tino prohibits any kind of documentation of his work. And the reason for doing so is because he um, is trying to, um, what's the word, uh, ensure the liveness of the performative actions that we uh, put in place. Um, and another thing in that we don't uh, work necessarily within the urban environment. He, since the beginning of his career, has always insisted on working uh, within institutions. In recent years, we sometimes do things outside of art institutions, but, but it's really the exception. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that, too, is that a lot of his practice is actually based on 
um, strategies very like those that we have talked about earlier today, specifically for Tino, the international situationists, is um, very informative and many of the strategies that we use come directly from the situationists and rather than being um, interested in working with those strategies outside of the institution, Tino's interested in working within the institutions, again, I think, arguably to um, ensure the liveness of those strategies so that they don't become uh, enshrined within the documentation, but that they can live, they, they, they can be experienced as live um, per performative actions. And so, in his, to his mind, one way of ensuring those strategies is to enshrine them within the, institu within the art institution itself that can actually, so that they can be enacted within that institution. Um, and one thing that you'll also notice if you go, so you can still see our exhibition both at the Trechikov and at the Shushev, um, and all of the works that we're showing here are actually, um, have been shown in other cities before. So what we do is, is we put in place a structure. And in each city that we work in, that structure is inhabited by local people. So um, one reason that Tino's also interested in working within the art institution is that it allows um, it enables a framework. And so it allows a frame, it allows a set of behaviors to be framed. And so that is perhaps where this idea of the mirror, you know, so what we do is that we set in place a structure and a, a structure, a rule, a game. It's basically a game where people uh, inhabit the rules of the game, the people the people that we work with also, unless it's, an, unless it's a dance piece, and we have several dance pieces on in the city, but the, the conversation pieces, which I think are perhaps more relevant to this discussion, is inhabited by normal people. So they're not performance artists, they're not actors, they're, they're real people with normal jobs. And within the structures that we put in place, they themselves, they are themselves. And the structures that we put in place ever so slightly different from the real world. And so hopefully what, what we enable is that people can meet each other within these new structures and they can meet each other again, so to say. And I think that that's something that I know, especially at the, at the Shushev Museum, we're showing a work called This Progress. Um, and This Progress is only a conversation that happens within a walk, and within this walk you meet people from four different generations. And you talk in the broadest possible sense about progress. And I know that for the people, the participants in particular, because that's where I get most of my information from, rather than we don't interview, we don't do any documentation, we don't interview the, the visitors, so I can only, I have some anecdotal evidence for what the visitors' experiences are, but since I work with the participants every day, I know what their experiences are. And I know that they're having conversations within this piece that they haven't had before. And they're meeting people in Moscow and, have, and talking to people in Moscow about things that they normally wouldn't talk to strangers about. And the strategies we put in place are extremely s simple, but we do allow people, and this is something that perhaps is a possibility that's offered by the urban environment is anonymity. So we offer our participants anonymity. So they exist within this new structure. They meet people mom momentarily, don't really know if you're ever gonna see each other again. And somehow within this momentary meeting and by slightly changing the rules of the game, people are able to have conversations that they don't allow themselves or that the normal social rules might normally stop them from doing. Um, is there anything else I wanted to say? Um, Can I ask you something? Yes. Do you, uh, do you ever imagine, um, like for instance, this progress where you definitely meet um, 
representatives of various generations on your way. Why does this have to happen within the, the EMT museum premises instead of like happening in the middle of a street? Like there are plenty of pedestrian areas in Moscow where there are no cars and you know, why, why not putting them on the streets? Or like um, the other work, which I, when my, my first encounter with Tina's work was at the Tate Modern where um, I would be just walking down the turbine hall and, uh, and you know, there would be a girl who would just make a circle running around me and she would do this several times and then at a certain point she would just whisper into my ear, um, this is a performance by Tino Segal, and then I would like be completely shocked because I would never think that performance art could be so simple and so straight to the point and so, you know, like painful for me even. So like, I would, I would feel like, okay, I'm a representative of kind of, you know, arts community, whatever, but uh, why, why w won't this hit the normal people? Do you think they would not feel this within like um, an urban situation where like on the street where people are not immediately related to the arts and um, do you think that won't work or what's Tino's logic behind it? What's your logic? I think Tino's becoming more and more open to it. I think that in the beginning he really needed the, the institution as a uh, as a kind of stamp of approval, or as a stamp like this can be considered art, you know, and whatever happens within the space is art, so thereby it was providing some sort of legitimi legitimization of a certain, of a different type of behavior. Um, but I think now, especially, I know that we were recently talking about whether or not to do these associations, which is what you saw at Tate Modern, on the street, um, somewhere in, in, in Germany where they offered, uh, they wanted us to do an exhibition. So that certainly could happen. With this, I mean, I was actually, personally, I was a little bit nervous um, when we first um, saw the Shushev Museum because it's, it's, it's specifically not a white cube and it really has a personality. And so, I mean, my, my, my worry is practical and to some extent, I guess that maybe it's Tino's original worry too is that we've never had, I was telling all of the, all of the interpreters, which is the people that, that work with us, to, that perform the work, because Tino doesn't use the word performance, so we use the word interpreter. Anyway, I was telling that, that we, they've never had such competition before, because it's a very dramatic space. So, you know, to compete with your own personal, non-dramatic, everyday stories is quite something, uh, though I'm very proud of them and they're managing very well. Um, but I think also what I, w what I was nervous about is that in such a space that's quite theatrical, that people would um, presume, like the visitors would presume to be entertained, that they would think that they were visiting a theater piece. And there is no script, and there's no, the, the pieces are not necessarily about entertainment, the pieces are about meeting each other in a different way, and specifically not really, you know, providing some sort of great excitement as such. So I was, um, I was nervous, but it, but it is working, and I think that this progress potentially, I mean, it's just, now I don't think it's so much anymore about whether or not it would be considered art. I think that's, that's clear, but it would be much more just practical, you know, how, one, how would one, it does need some sort of frame, or some sort of inside and outside. Many people know that works by Tino Segal are available for um, acquiring, for purchasing, and uh, basically like some collectors, there are like editions of those works, like I've heard that some of the works are editions of four. So like practically what you buy as a collector of art, you buy a certain amount of instructions that are given to you so you could re-perform, re-enact the work at certain environment. Would there be limitations put by the artist towards the collector um, about particular circumstances for reenactment. Like, would, he, would Tino tell a collector, oh, you never do this in the middle of the square in the city, or never do this on the street, do it at home, or if you want to present this work, invite people to your kitchen and do it there. Like, would there be specific, like, territory marked by, um, at the moment of purchase? So far, yes. So, for example, some works he would refuse to sell somebody if they didn't have the... It, it, some works are, are only available for institutions that have gallery spaces to show them. Other works he's conceived specifically for private collectors, so they actually do happen at the dinner table, for example. Um, I think that he would, I think that he, uh, as I, like he's maturing and also the world is changing. I think he would definitely be open to showing his works under different circumstances, but he'd certainly ensure that he was part of that conversation. 
Дорогие друзья, может быть, у вас возникли какие-то вопросы. Тиносигал — это ужасно сложная территория, не поддающаяся быстрому освоению для тех, кто ничего никогда на ней не бывал. Но, пожалуйста, задайте ваш вопрос скорее же. Hello. Then, so as I understand, you divide art and entertainment in your work, and uh, if I'm right, why so? Divide art and entertainment. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Dare no, I say? Dare intent. I say that most artists make that difference? I think that most artists wouldn't consider like high art. Entertainment, most serious artists, but maybe I'm just uh, making. I mean, Tino's very happy with with uh, with pop and would consider pop art, you know. And this other work that we're showing, this variation, is all about pop music. So, um, we just don't want people. The interpreters don't have an obligation to please the visitors. I think that's what I meant. Um, any other questions? Yes, please. Show какие-то вопросы. Thank you so much, Luis. That was quite an important impact. Thank you. And um, и мы сейчас двигаемся дальше. У нас с вами um, следующий блок разговора. We have the next uh, uh, section uh, of our discussion. Uh, incredibly important for everybody present. A performance as a monument. Uh, what remains uh, in the city uh, after uh, a performance? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, we're not going to talk about Pavlensky separately. Lots of those present are going to have something to say. It's a fact of the past. Uh, the story is over, um, or at least uh, for now, it's over. And this monument that emerged, uh, the, the white little hill in our memories in the middle of the Red Square, full of pain, full of rebellion, full of helplessness uh, in the face of what's going on. This is the light that's going to be in the middle of the Red Square for um, uh, ages. The others uh, um, left their own trace in 68. Uh, when was the performance by the dissidents that came out into the Red Square? That wasn't a performance per se, but uh, uh, history has its own say. And some of the happenings that were never considered by historians or the artists or the organizers or participants themselves as live art with time um, are sort of uh, making their way into textbooks or research on the topic and uh, it so turns out that time sets its own priorities uh, and these highlights that are ephemeral and I would like Anatoly Osmolovsky, you've seen some of his works on the screen today uh, in uh, Sasha's uh, presentation, he'll talk a little bit. Uh, I can't offer or insist on anything as a topic of discussion for Anatoly. When we exchanged our messages on Facebook, he he said he uh, was very radical about what he thought about Pavlensky. It's very important. Uh, it's a guy who not only is writing the history of the genre, but he also has a, a vision from the future. <coughs> One, two. I'll try to be brief. To tell you the truth, if we talk about happenings or performance as a monument, the only thing that comes to mind is to state the fact that at the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, the territory of Moscow, the territory of the Soviet Union, uh, got its freedom, the overview that existed during the Soviet regime, this targeted control, first it weakened and then it disappeared altogether. Within the artistic community, a rather narrow circle, an idea, a concept emerged that you need to open up, penetrate new territories uh, for messages and for delivering new statements. And one of the key elements of performances of the time was to find an exclusive, strange point where you need to get to 
and from which you need to sort of preach something, transmit something, not even talk, but to show things. Performance, although you should be calling them acts, performance is, um, let's not go into this um, terminological debate. What's the difference between an act and a performance? But I'm going to show you two of my performances. The first one is this uh, text, uh, 1991, 18th of April, in the Red Square, says fuck, uh, three months before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this was uh, a performance that was formally linked to the ethics law that came out at the time. The idea that was there is that uh, you need to sort of calm the p p political situation in, in, in Russia and an ethics law came out and in the public spaces you were not supposed to use foul language, obscene words uh, and it was perceived with a certain sense of humor by the entire population of Russia and the Soviet Union and we decided to juxtapose and to, to confront the law with our act. I'm not going to go out into the details of the criminal proceedings. Uh, obviously, uh, a criminal uh, case was initiated against us. Uh, a, a new article was introduced. Uh, we were pacifists. We were cynical. Uh, we were accused of uh, cynical and bad intent mischief. I guess that's the way it was formulated in the Soviet Code of Law. Uh, it was closed uh, due to lack of substance and to uh, a large amount of public opinion that was rather positive towards our performance. The public opinion changes and it's never a constant, so we should never lose faith. If you're watching television, what you see in television is like flows of stupidity and lies and I can sort of calm you down that it's not forever in Russia. I can remember 25 years ago, we were a country of victorious atheism. We're currently opposite the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, and we're talking about uh, um, atheism, Uchitil's uh, film being banned. Uh, uh, time will pass, and everything will change. And Perhaps the Christ, the Savior, will be blown up again. It's possible in Russia. And maybe they will build a stadium or something else. Going back to the topic of discussion, we were looking for these exclusive points. And one of the points was the Red Square. Um, so we discovered this destination as a sort of presentation space and the next destination was our performance uh, um, on the shoulder of Mayakovsky uh, um, the journey to the land of Brobdingnegs if you don't know how they are the uh, giants uh, in uh, Swift's uh, um, Oliver's travels um, this amazing metaphors and uh, he has this voyage to the land of the giants. So we found this exclusive point um, at the shoulder of Mayakovsky and we created this image. Did you use a crane, like a construction crane? Uh, yes, of course. It's not really easy to climb onto his shoulder like that. And it's rather dangerous as well. I've started falling down because it's really sort of... And not quite steep and 
I had this illusion to try and grab onto his ear, hold onto his head, but his head was so huge that I couldn't wrap it around with my arms. And uh, it seems from a distance that it's not that big. In fact, it's huge. It's gigantic. You can't put your hand around it. And uh, it wasn't a very comfortable space to be. I'm going to come to the end. How, how long did you stay there for? don't know, 10 minutes maybe? Quite uh, some time, I was sort of started to lose sensation in my limbs. I started to slip down and I kept telling people, yelling downstairs, get me off, get me off. I was going to smoke a cigar, which I did. And now I want to show you another spot against everyone. This is not the beginning of the 90s anymore. The first uh, action I showed you at 91, Mayakovsky was 93, and uh, this is 99. This is an example of uh, a performance an act that had a purpose. All of the, the previous two had no real purpose uh, beside the fact of just happening. Um, but this one was incorporated into a campaign, um, an election campaign against all candidates. Uh, the elections in 1999 and we put together a group that was uh, agitating to vote against everyone and we chose a spot. This is the mausoleum, Lenin's mausoleum in Red Square and we hang this banner um, urging people to vote against everyone. Now this sort of option is no longer available during elections but it was there at the time and uh, if they gained the majority of votes then the elections would be invalidated and there would be a re-election. Of course we did not manage to succeed uh, we were uh, quickly covered by the FSB and our activity was uh, significantly constrained. Uh, coming to the end of my brief presentation, I would like to say a couple of words, general theoretical words. Pavlensky was uh, the last character showed. Everybody likes him. I don't know why. I think he's one of the most boring, non-interesting, unworthy, and vulgar. I would give and go for as far as saying types of performers. If you ask me, are there any criteria for performances? Or what's a good performance? What's a bad performance? One of the criteria, and this is relevant not just to performances but to contemporary art in general, you have to understand that contemporary art and performance in particular never symbolizes anything. If a performance or a work of art symbolizes something, it's a bad one. When Pavlensky is nailing his balls to the Red Square and he says, I did this because I tried to symbolize the fact that we are all immobilized, constrained. It's a type, it's a character, it's feature of bad, stupid, non-professional performance. If I was more terminological, it's like a narrative literature-based performance and a good performance just like a good work of contemporary art is defined by the following. It's there. Like fuck in the Red Square. It's there. What does it symbolize? Fuck in Red Square. Nothing. It symbolizes nothing. It's just a fuck in Red Square. What's the Black Square by Malevich? What does it symbolize? It symbolizes nothing. Malevich's Black Square symbolizes nothing. It just says Black Square. It's not the end of time. It's not a blackout. It's not a dead end. It's just a Black Square. Philosophically speaking, Heidegger uses this word. You put it there. It's there. It's been put. It's just there. It exists. The same applies to performances when I was there on Bikovsky's shoulder. You don't need an explanation to understand what the act is about. 
dead alive. There's lots of associations that um, come up, but you don't need to vocalize anything. You don't need to explain everything. If you have a performance and then next to it, you're standing there explaining, I did this because it symbolizes, and then you start talking bullshit. That means it's a bad performance, a bad artist. And Pavlensky, in this sense, is a bad artist, although a heroic one. Thank you. Okay, questions to the our theorist or the artist. You can choose which one. If you don't have any questions, you're just an amazing, sensitive audience. You're always silent. Are you scared of something? Go ahead. Poplinski is not somebody I perceive as an artist or a performer. I think he is um, more of um, um, an activist. In my personal perception, it's something much more political than artistic, although indirectly it is art. What's the question? You just wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to raise the topic. Thank you so much. Maybe somebody wants to ask a question, although you can comment as well if you want. It is a dialogue. Okay. The situation of having to explain a performance that Anatoly was talking about is a situation uh, that raises the most questions to performances that were conceived or based on by Petr Versilov, a great many acts and performances. I didn't know as much uh, as I wanted to um, about Perter before I read an article in GQ. Perter is probably unhappy with the article, but it did explain a lot to me that this is a guy. It's online if you want to read it. Is that okay if people read it? Go ahead. At least we, we know that this is a guy who created the content for activism in the last 10 years. Uh, he was uh, an incredible artist. He can answer your questions about uh, what was happening across the river uh, and other more distant localities. Because we're talking about uh, the city, nobody has a more clear delineated dialogue with those than those that were arranged by Voina and the Pussy Riot group, or maybe we should rather call them a project rather than a group. Herpeter Verzilov, the last speaker for tonight, is going to continue uh, the topic of performance as an environment and its traces on the body of the city. A round of applause for Peter Verzilov, please. To begin with, I would like to respond uh, to Anatoly's uh, statement about uh, Pavlensky. Asmolovsky thinks that Pavlensky is a bad artist uh, because Pavlensky comments um, rather at length and uh, not his own um, acts. So what he does uh, is a great jest, but the fact that he's commenting on what he does, that turns them into bad art. A lot uh, like to comment at length on what they do, and very often it's incredibly boring and impossible to read. I guess the uh, Pyotr being unable to be eloquent about what he does and uh, making these unnecessary comments turns him into a bad artist. I don't think it changes the quality of what he does essentially uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, first time I hear that he's excessive at commenting things, I thought he was silent. I, I thought a lot of his acts are about silence. Uh, what he does is uh, self-explanatory. I don't think they need any comments or explanation. I think he's brilliant at uh, talking about what he does. It was interesting to learn. I have my questions to run, Natalia. I guess nobody else is interested out of those present, but I've got my questions. Piotr will show us uh, some images. 
A lot of the speakers today covered things at length. I really don't feel like uh, I'm an expert, and I don't want to go into the theory at all. I'll just do a brief review and talk about some of our not most well-known happenings and acts. Uh, before you do this, um, I would like to ask for a lot of artists and organizers of the artistic process, whatever they call themselves, producers or curators, historians or um, theorists, uh, markers are very important. What do you call yourself within Vaina? Are you a participant? Are you the ideologist? Or are you talking about Pussy Riot? What's the term? that needs to be applied to you uh, and how you're going to go down in the books of history within my team so we were always making fun of all these terms and names and statuses and usually people are just participants of a group or a team we're all equal regardless of who does what at any given moment in time and the situation is constantly changing let me ask Sasha because some of the Voina and Pussy Riot teams are older than five years we can ask Sasha there are some performances that go back what's Petro Brazil's status um, from the point of view of uh, historians and theorists. So we talk about Vaina, he's a participant first and foremost. If we talk about Pussy Riot, then I really can't comment because it's so, so challenging and tricky. I'm not going to make any comments. We don't even know all of the participants, right? A lot of these questions uh, will be uh, covered by Marat Gelman's exhibition, co-curated by Alec Kulik. Uh, it's going to take place uh, in the Touch Gallery in London in October. Uh, it's going to be in uh, November, and a lot of it will be dedicated to uh, the various uh, acts. Uh, there will be an immer immersive theatrical project as well. There will be a copy of a Russian prison uh, in the various aspects, and the London viewers will have a chance to feel some of the parts of the different parts of the Russian prison, the barracks, and a lot of people have already bought tickets uh, um, from Moscow to London um, to, to experience this. I'm always hesitant about the various theatrical practices, uh, particularly immersive uh, theater, so we're going to see how it goes. Uh, we talked about some of the performances. I guess the most interesting we can do at the end of the evening is uh, sort of free visits. Uh, some of our acts, I'll tell you about some others you might not have heard of before. Uh, an important message uh, we're trying to deliver with what we do uh, after we appeared in 2007 as a group and we started with our activism was the fact that we were really irritated that the artists of the millennia uh, wanted to work in institutions, in specific artistic dedicated uh, environments, not interested in the streets or the urban setting. They wanted to make art in a very uh, sort of marked out frameworks and internally we thought that this was uh, not in line with the spirit of the times. In 2007 I came up and uh, Largely, this is why we came into being and why Pussy Riot and Pavlensky continued this tradition of interacting with the urban setting. This is one of our first, uh, um, this is a feast, uh, um, a tribute to uh, Prigov, uh, who had a heart attack uh, on his way to uh, one of the acts that we were planning together with him. Uh, he had a heart attack a week later. He died, and 40 days after that, so um, uh, remembering uh, Dmitry Prigov uh, um, on the uh, circular um, ring of the uh, Moscow Metro, we had this sort of uh, feast uh, to celebrate him with, with food and with people joining us, um, uh, reading his uh, poetry and uh, rather uh, these are the less known acts uh, that we did. 
For instance, at the Biological Museum, everybody knows what went on there. That's not so interesting. I guess so. This is um, a small collection of the less known um, works by us. A very interesting one called The Censorship Sucks. It happened in May 2008 in Tel Aviv. Uh, dedicated with um, uh, announcing um, uh, a claim to Timofey Vesemadouro for they were accused of uh, uh, religious intolerance. Um, previously, uh, there was uh, a case against the curators for their professional activities. So to mark these um, accusative claims, uh, activists uh, uh, shut off the uh, the road and had slogans to hell with culture, uh, uh, men's uh, uh, cops uh, sucking their turners and other slogans that were incredibly provocative to attract attention to the case. Another uh, happening uh, in 2008, not very well known. It's important uh, for those times. It was called uh, cops uh, wearing um, a priest's rope. And in the process of, we created this personality that we think very harmoniously fits into the image of contemporary Russia. This is a priest with a cross, wearing a cop's hat with a sports bag. Like that they used to steal from a supermarket. It wasn't really stealing or nicking uh, in the process of the sex of he sort of slowly placed stuff in a trolley with luxury premium groceries and then when he got to the tills very slowly having nodded to the guard and the cashier he would just uh, take it out of the supermarket this whole trolley and it was important to show in the process of this performance is that in 2008 somebody working uh, or guarding a supermarket seen somebody uh, this noble and this powerful never for a second doubted whether they were going to pay for it for this huge trolley of exclusive goods and it would cost a lot of money but they never even asked and then we documented uh, the consumption of the goods uh, somewhere in one of the garages nearby. Another performance uh, that uh, uh, we thought would fit into the topic of today, uh, in memory of December, it happened in December 2007. Um, at Moscow anniversary, one of the hugest uh, supermarket, Oshan, as a present to the mayor at the time, Yuri Lushkov, the essence of the happening and the process of the act, Voina participants would execute in a, a sort of a ritual, uh, two social categories that were particularly favored by Lushkov. Uh, these were illegal immigrants from Tajikistan and Middle Asia, uh, and um, lesbians and gays that would happen live uh, in a, a huge supermarket. M migrants from uh, Middle Asia were led into the supermarket. They were lined up. Then they were taken into the electric appliances uh, department. Uh, and subsequently, this is a very famous photograph uh, in the West. Uh, it was the image of contemporary Russia. That's the way it was perceived. Uh, they were sort of hanged, executed. Uh, uh, during the happening, there were loads of very curious occurrences. So the first gods of Ashan that came up to us and started to ask us what was going on, we showed them a document in which it said, signed by the authorities of Moscow, this permission to execute. 
So the head of the Oshan gods, uh, and it was like a formal document, so he just nodded and he said, well, go on. And this was very symptomatic, and uh, that's why this happening was possible almost till the very end, only at the very end when they saw that uh, there was people hanging in their electrical appliance department started to panic, they called the police, uh, and they tried to uh, stop us. But this is uh, the same from a different angle. A lot of the Vojna activists enjoyed the fact that some of the people who came to the supermarket continued indifferently to purchase light bulbs and select like wires or warm light, cold light. People would just like push away the hanging bodies and continue to purchase their light bulbs or whatever they needed for their household appliances. Again, that was quite symptomatic, a very interesting detail to the happening. Another shot, again, gays, activists, migrants from Middle Asia, another act, a more direct one, again, at the end of 2008, a training um, of an assault of the White House. Uh, the Ukraine hotel was being reconstructed. And we managed to get a huge laser project, projector into it, and uh, we borrowed it from our friends uh, that were dealing in uh, like um, uh, advertising, and we have uh, uh, occupied one of the warehouses on top of the uh, Ukraine hotel, and we managed to project the skull and the bones onto the White House of the Russian Federation. This is November 2008. It's coincided with the beginning of the world economic crisis uh, that everybody felt, including Russia. So so this was this black mark to the government of Russia. How, how long did this projection last for? A few minutes for quite some time. And the second part of the act was that the participants of the Voina um, group uh, started to run around the territory. They climbed over the fence. Many years uh, later, through interrogation and talking to the Federal Security Services, uh, when a head of the department came to the interrogations and they said that even at the internal meetings, they were discussing how unacceptable it was not to prevent uh, things like this from happening. Another act from the end of 2008 uh, be the ban of clubs. Uh, our activists decided to weld shut entrances uh, into a restaurant. Um, it was called in Tretikovska, opened by Mikhail Leontiev. Uh, and it was a symbol for us of the new times, uh, uh, New Year Eve. Uh, and this event was welded shut with um, steel sheets um, in a festive um, effort. Again, I showed you a, a few of the less known happenings that we arranged. Pussy Riot Act, so well known to those present here today, but aside the one that happened in the cathedral, there were a few more, one of the first ones. So it had to do with the public transport, our trolley buses, more trolley buses, another act uh, in autumn 2011, October and November, just prior to the large political processes, litigations, this had, this was called death to Putin glamour, some loud name, I don't really remember. And they were dancing on the various objects, like a f unsanctioned performance at a fashion tour, um, setting fire to flower, a shoe shop performance somewhere. Um, and one of the more well-known uh, performances in Red Square 
That was uh, the second after uh, the cathedral performance that for many people became a symbol of what was then happening uh, in Russia and the political crisis Russia was going through. That's all I had to say. Thank you so much. I guess if you have no further questions, and oh wow, there is a question. Hi, Grigori. Hi, Piotr. I'm tormented by this thing, this, this famous story when you were going to uh, cover the Cathedral of Christ the Savior with shit. Your companion wanted to do that. You were against it. Why? Uh, it was suggested by my, I didn't think it was interesting. I think I thought it was unnecessary. I thought we should go ahead with it. So it's not that you were scared of uh, uh, punishment. Um, I just didn't think it was interesting. Uh, well, we fell out much later. So that wasn't the reason for our falling out. And uh, the second question to Sasha, why didn't you say anything about uh, Pasha 103? Is this a, a kind of a, a academic snobbery? You don't think those performances are art? I just didn't have time. Uh, if you talk about the urban space, uh, 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 this uh, guerrilling uh, Bonus and Makovic's performance. Uh, uh, if you remember this exhibition from 2014, uh, performance cartography history, those acts were included. Um, uh, Basha uh, 183, and they were all included into the catalog, not a catalog, even a book of performances. Um, today's 15-minute um, overview uh, is not an exhausting academic. Um, if I'm going to write a PhD, I'm going to definitely mention the ones that you're talking about. I don't know if this is a question to Peter. I would want to know at which point uh, does political and social activism turn into contemporary art? Are there laws to this or a framework? Or uh, I guess it's a question to you laws and frameworks. Mm. I guess you should go to the police or the, or the authorities. Um. Here we should be talking about the history of Western European and American art, where the political context as one of the other many contexts is coming to the fore uh, as the driver for the transformation of the modernist art when it becomes contemporary. The political agenda largely determines the artworks that emerged in the 60s. For Russia, as a new state uh, that came to uh, being in 91, this was true from the very beginning. Some of the acts uh, during the perestroika period uh, were also political, but they were so ironic and so ambiguous there's always doubts whether they were actually political uh, manifests uh, or were they just a slight comment uh, on reality. I guess I didn't quite understand your question. I don't know the difference, don't feel the difference between a political act and an artist. I, I know what you're talking about. Uh, here, uh, what's important is the context uh, that sort of serves as a basis for the artist to deliver their message. And in many instances, these gestures are uh, double natured, like Yes Men, the group that relies on manipulation methodological manipulation in contemporary art and the development of contemporary media uses various uh, political platforms uh, for uh, protest statements and that's why it's not really clear whether it's a work of art or uh, it's just a political statement. Another point I wanted to make in 2012, uh, in the summer, after numerous uh, political acts, uh, um, 
in the Fabrica Center of uh, Creative Workshops, uh, there was an exhibition of anonymous protest arts uh, from the Sakharov Prospect, from the Bologna Square, uh, protests um, and the White Ring. And they resembled works of art, but in essence, these weren't because they were just a tool to deliver a political message. And it was really clear in that it's exhibition. It's a question of mimicry, I guess, uh, how our political campaigns pretend to be contemporary art or contemporary art pretends to be political. It's just a matter of your personal criteria because art can't directly answer any questions. Uh, you need to sort of distance yourself uh, from it. Uh, and uh, I guess it's already happening. If it happens, then it becomes art. If not, it remains prose. The double nature of art is characteristic not just of performance. When you look at a painting, for instance, uh, a battle scene, you can see at the same time a painting and the glorification of uh, some state. And on the third side, you can uh, get information about uh, what armor knights used to carry or what weapons were used at the time. So at the same time, it's a historic reconstruction. In this sense, it's normal, but art, the art of performance has this ambition of uh, been stripped and liberated from external meanings as much as possible, political meanings, etc. It's a utopic desire that sets certain criteria within a certain system of coordinates. Performances that have a political subtext particularly a narrow one, are not considered to be very successful, but I'll repeat myself here, uh, from the point of view of high art, art for the sake of art, modernist art. Unfortunately, Voina as a group have a problem with this, unlike Pussy Riot. I would say that a key criteria here is self-identification. Uh, based on this, uh, during the millennium years, uh, the National Bolshevik Party used to exist, and uh, uh, they did a lot of performances. Uh, if they were trying to present themselves as artists, uh, they could be inscribed into the history of contemporary art. A lot of what they did would be like uh, peaceful uh, assaults of uh, various spaces, but because these people never uh, presented themselves as artists, were never interested in existing in artistic artists, it's not an issue that we need to resolve. Why not? The, the war group, uh, when, when did you first start talking about being a group or being activists? Uh, the participants of the group uh, were interested at the same time in contemporary art and in politics. Uh, uh, we were never in conflict. Uh, uh, politics and contemporary art were equally important for all of the uh, participants of the group. Another point I wanted to make. Uh, a position that emerged in the global artistic environment in Russia in spring uh, this year, Garage held a triennale of contemporary Russian art with a separate directory on art activism. And one of the projects uh, by Katrina Nashova was uh, uh, exhibited. And if you look into the exhibits, some of them were full of humor, mimicking political campaigns. Uh, Artem Loskutov's and Babushki's after the funeral groups uh, exhibits uh, two very critical, very direct statements uh, by the Schwemme group uh, or Katrin's uh, statements. 
And there, in the same exhibition hall, there were th same things that had nothing to do with direct political or uh, social criticism. Uh, Alisa Yoffa's work, I was very full of imagery and was denying any kind of utilitarianism. But coexisted in the same zone of political protests, but in a much more sort of blurry, unspecific way, not targeting anybody specific. It was both political criticism and some kind of existential protest uh, against the way things are at the moment. A lot of the instruments can be classified as such. Uh, a chance for uh, the last question to Pertzer or to any other participant of uh, today's discussion. A silly question, perhaps. Are there any taboos? I'm not being sarcastic. Uh, or are you just exploring the topic, developing the topic? trying to understand what's acceptable and what's not. Or another silly question, can you make any comments on 2018, the year ahead? Would you actually hang an immigrant or a gay guy? I guess uh, uh, every person is full of contradictions and uh, uh, you can't answer a question as a citizen or as a son or as a mother. Uh, Dmitry Prigov, our mentor in a way, this is the answer he gave as a contemporary artist. He said, as part of my artistic practice, I can kill someone. But by killing someone, I need to understand that I'll need to continue my existence in society and I'll need to be punished. There will be consequences. Thank you. I would like to draw a brief conclusion. Thank you, Pater, so much uh, for your intervention. Uh, we talked about the urban setting in the city. Park um, Zariazia, a utopic space, opened yesterday um, uh, with uh, invited families uh, not allowed to bring prams, but with kids. Uh, and there was this international community that was invited architects, famous architects, that built the park at the same time in the same city that we live in today. Uh, with performances happening uh, even now as we sit here, Artem Loskotov and his team um, applied an image with a logo of Moscow's anniversary uh, and Kirill Serebrenikov's portrait within this uh, logo. While we're talking performances and activism here now, there is a chance that by 2018 uh, for the World Cup, uh, our friends will be released from prison, culture managers, artists, film directors, theater directors, that will be much more important as a consequence of any dialogue, any discussion. Let's just, as this last effort, this last episode of our conversation, let's all direct our thoughts towards this happening, because all this talk about it is uh, impossible. Thank you so much for being with us.